My name is Simon Tran and I'm ProPublica's events associate. Welcome to What Ohio Needs to Know About Taxes in 2021. Tonight's event is sponsored by McKinsey and & Company and co-presented by ProPublica and Code for America. For those new to us, um, ProPublica is a nonprofit newsroom dedicated to investigative journalism. We're currently growing our coverage of the Midwest, so it's great to have this conversation in Ohio tonight, as well as folks um, outside of Ohio. Thanks for joining us. Code for America is a civic tech organization that uses technology to design equitable government services. And they operate getyourrefund.org, a national coalition that provides free tax filing assistance to low-income families. Today, we'll talk about both our country's broader tax system and the tax filing process. To help guide us through this, we were joined by David Newville, uh, Senior Program Director of Tax Benefits at Code for America, where he oversees getyourrefund.org, which I described earlier. David previously served as Vice President of Policy and Research at Prosperity Now, a nonprofit focused on building financial security for working families, as well as a Senior Policy Advisor at the U.S. Department of the Treasury. We also have Rachel Square, uh, who is the Tax Time Program Manager at United Way of Central Ohio in Columbus. Tax Time is a coalition of organizations collaborating to provide free, high quality tax preparation services and financial resources referral to central Ohio residents. Rachel's VITA team serves as the lead for Ohio's getyourrefund.org um, uh, for the coalition. And finally, we have Elizabeth Moreska, a clinical professor of law at Fordham University School of Law and the supervising attorney of the school's tax clinic. She specializes in federal tax controversy and litigation against the IRS and has advised clients, attorneys, and policymakers on tax issues which arise in consumer matters. Thank you to our panel for joining us tonight. Um, one note for our audience, this session is not designed to give advice about your personal tax or financial situation. Rather, it's intended to provide resources and information to clarify the often confusing steps and requirements in the tax filing system. Also, this session is being recorded um, and a link uh, to the video will be emailed to everyone who registered. To kick things off tonight, we will first hear from ProPublica reporters who reported extensively on the tax prep industry and the IRS. To provide context around the systemic issues that can make taxes so complicated, we have a brief video that summarizes their findings across four key areas. It's about 10 minutes long. Hi, I'm Justin Elliott. I'm Paul Keel. And I'm Lydia DePillis. We're investigative reporters at ProPublica covering business, economics, and politics. We're here today to talk to you about tax filing services, the IRS, and what you can expect during this year's tax filing season. We'll talk about our reporting from the past several years on these issues, as well as information you need to know for this year. The modern history of how we do tax prep in the United States really begins uh, about two decades ago, uh, late 90s, early 2000s, around the turn of the millennium. And that was a period in which uh, more and more Americans were getting personal computers, people were, uh, people were getting onto the internet, 
Um, and uh, everyone at the time filed their taxes using paper forms. Um, but there, there were people inside the government who were uh, thinking a lot about the potential of the internet. Um, and there was a proposal actually during the early years of the George W. Bush administration um, to get the IRS to create a new uh, online electronic tax filing system. And the idea was this was gonna be a free option that any taxpayer could use, uh, you know, made by the government, uh, an alternative to sending in the paper forms that everyone had been doing uh, for so many years. Um, Intuit, uh, the Silicon Valley company that uh, makes TurboTax, um, at that time already had a very lucrative business uh, selling TurboTax software. Um, and uh, immediately when the Bush administration put forth this proposal to have the IRS create a government uh, free tax filing system into it and the rest of the tax prep industry saw this as a potentially existential threat to, uh, to their growing tax prep business. Uh, the companies uh, embarked upon a very aggressive lobbying campaign um, that was ultimately successful in beating back this uh, free IRS uh, tax filing proposal. Um, the way that they killed the proposal was they basically made a deal with the government. This was sort of uh, an early public-private partnership in technology. And the, this was, it was, it's called the free file deal. Um, and the basic deal going back to the early 2000s was the tax prep industry led by Intuit um, promised the government that they would offer uh, a free version of their software to most Americans um, and in exchange, the IRS had to promise never to create its own public uh, tax filing option. Um, this uh, free file option, as it's called, uh, was available to most Americans. But uh, the, the story of the 20 years since this deal was made is a story of the tax prep industry led by Intuit. Uh, taking steps to make sure as few Americans actually use this, this truly free option as possible. So uh, that's the history of sort of how we got to where we are today. The situation that Americans find themselves in today when it comes to tax prep is uh, if you go onto Google uh, and type in uh, file my taxes or file my taxes for free, um, you will be bombarded by advertisements from uh, Intuit for their product, TurboTax, from h &R Block, from uh, a whole host of other companies offering what are advertised as uh, quote unquote free tax filing options. Um, the fundamental trick that the industry has been playing on American tax filers for many years now is that there are two different uh, version, free versions of the software, and one is actually free, and the other uh, often leads you to pay a fee. So uh, the truly free option uh, is called IRS Free File. Uh, it's a .gov website. Um, but uh, on the other hand, there's a whole host of commercial products. The biggest one is, is called TurboTax Free, uh, which are actually very different than IRS Free File. If you are one of the people who ends up clicking on a link for TurboTax free or h and Block free, um, essentially what happens is uh, depending on your specific tax filing situation, if you have certain types of tax forms, certain types of income, for example, if you're, let's say, an Uber driver and you have uh, 1099s that you get uh, as part of your uh, Uber income. Um, suddenly, if you are in TurboTax free version, um, after you've put in a lot of your information, you've, you've been uh, spending a lot of time with the software, uh, TurboTax will suddenly tell you, actually, to file this form, you have to upgrade to TurboTax Deluxe, which might cost $100, or maybe you have to upgrade to an even more expensive version of the software. Um, and what we showed in our reporting was that uh, there's literally millions of Americans every year who are uh, getting caught by this fundamental trick where they're clicking on an ad or product that's labeled as free, but then they get three quarters of the way through the process and suddenly they realize they have to pay to finish. Uh, even though these same people, if they had just found the right 
IRS site, the free file site would have been able to file actually for free using basically the same software. Um, there was a inspector general report uh, that looked at, at this issue um, uh, after our reporting uh, a couple of years ago. And, and the inspector general uh, found that 14 million Americans in 2019 at least um, had paid for tax prep uh, that they could have gotten for free through uh, the free file program. Um, so if, you, uh, if you're looking for the truly free tax prep option, uh, try to find the IRS free file version. It's, you should start on a .gov site. So a lot of our reporting uh, for the last couple of years in the IRS is focused on the fact that the IRS has been starved of resources for the last 10 years, really. And it's not like it was drowning in resources before that started. So that what that means uh, for people is that basic things, like if you would try to contact the IRS, um, a lot of times uh, it's hard to even get through to talk to someone. Um, any correspondence of the mail is going to take months on end to resolve. Um, and what we found is that uh, a lot of the cuts that happened as a result of uh, basically budget cuts to the agency. They've lost a lot of personnel. Um, and it's been a different story how people have been affected depending on how much income they have. So people at the top of the income uh, ladder have really benefited from this because if the IRS is uh, short-staffed, uh, what that means is a lot fewer audits are going to get done, um, particularly people who are upper income because those sorts of audits are really resources intensive and take a really uh, skilled uh, agent to do them. Whereas people lower down the income scale often are really audited by computers. So uh, a computer might challenge, um, you know, someone's claim of a child on their tax return or ask them to prove up the fact that, you know, they said they made this much money, uh, you know, freelancing or, or something like that. Um, and so you get a letter in the mail and um, it can be pretty intimidating to deal with. Um, and then you have to deal also with the fact that the IRS is short staffed and it's hard to get answers for anything. We found there's a real imbalance in the cuts to the agencies who's been impacted by that. So as Paul and Justin have probably already told you, after a decade of declining funding and staffing, the IRS was asked to do something in 2020 that was unprecedented, probably in its history, which was during a pandemic, get stimulus checks out to 160 million Americans essentially overnight. And what the pandemic meant for the IRS was like many federal agencies, they had to shift to remote work as quickly as possible. And that meant shutting down many of their processing centers. But the way that I, the IRS still works, much of it is still on paper. And so you had mail coming into these processing centers, piling up in tractor trailers because nobody could get there to deal with it. And remember, the pandemic came in the middle of 2019 tax filing season. So if you filed a tax return by mail, you may not have heard back even yet. Um, and that causes a lot of trouble for people who normally depend on getting their dependable refunds back in a relatively prompt fashion. And then later on, it became important for stimulus checks. So, but let me go back to the summer and fall of 2020, when the IRS was trying to get stimulus checks to the people who really needed them the most. And often those were folks either without bank accounts or who hadn't ever filed taxes, at least recently. And those people all had to be asked to file a special form and reaching all of them was really difficult. So asking the IRS to cope with all of these changing uh, protocols with less money, less staff, uh, less processing centers open and no extra money to do all this outreach that they were being asked to do meant that inevitably there was gonna end up being a cascade of problems that continue into 2021. Now, they're being asked to do a second and third round of stimulus checks, which are getting progressively easier because they now know how to get the money out and how to find people. The IRS did get another $1.5 billion in the most recent 
stimulus bill, the American Rescue Plan, in order to try to modernize their systems and boost their staffing. But it's, um, it's a paltry way to make up for uh, 10 years of declining funding. And it doesn't look like the problems are going to get much better uh, just with that on an ongoing basis. All right, everyone, um, I'm going to ask our panelists to come back to join us. Hi, um, I think. We need to start over the oh now we have permission <laughs> thank you perfect sorry about that um well welcome everyone back um so that was a lot of information a lot of things that we covered and it kind of ended on a bummer note but there are resources and information to help you navigate all of this um, for one, ProPublica has published a free tax guide full of free fact-checked tax information, and I'll make sure to drop the link in the chat box for everyone to have. But we also have this panel um, for everyone um, uh, to share information more about these issues, right? And by the way, if you have a question for the panelists at any time, feel free to type it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll we've also received some questions in advance that we'll get to. So, um, first things first, at ProPublica, we found that a lot of people who don't know where to turn when they have questions about their taxes, um, in addition to the IRS free file tax uh, file system that the video discussed, what are some free tax options that you've had experience with? And David, we'll start with you. Absolutely, thanks, Simon. <clears throat> and on behalf of Code for America, it's great to partner with you. Uh, you all at ProPublica today and to get this information out to folks, you know, as we saw in the videos, you know, taxes can be perplexing and complicated and stress inducing in general. Uh, this year, it's even more so given everything going on with the pandemic and all the new benefits that are kind of being thrown out in the middle of the tax season. But the good news is there are a lot of uh, uh, valuable free resources and trustworthy resources that folks can access uh, in the pandemic, even though the IRS itself has limited resources. One of the best ones to go to is, uh, is the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. It's uh, the VITA program. It's a public-private partnership that's overseen by the IRS, but it's actually administered by uh, local programs throughout the country, nonprofits usually in partnerships. Um, to help folks, uh, typically if you have income uh, below $57,000 a year, you can access VITA services normally. Uh, the model would be you'd be able to do it in person. And there are some places where you can, limited places where you can access VITA in person. I'm not sure specifically about Ohio, but Rachel might be able to elaborate on that later. But, you know, given the pandemic and the need to socially distance, you know, getyourrefund.org, uh, uh, which, you know, came about from Code for America, allows uh, folks to virtually access VITA services in partnership with VITA sites invite volunteers to, to get their taxes done, uh, obviously at a safe distance. There's a couple different models. You know, you can go to the website and learn more about it and access it if you're eligible. Um, through Get Your Refund, it's eligible to folks that have incomes uh, $66,000 and below um, to, are able to access those services. You can go there and you can both find a tool that can help you uh, locate a local VITA site near you in person. Uh, or you can go on and use the virtual service. And there's a variety of different models if you're not fully comfortable going fully digital. You know, there's a, there's a valet model where you can kind of drop off your paperwork at a VITA site and a volunteer will prepare it remotely and get back to you to finish your return. And, you know, there are some hybrids where you can come in and do your own compute, do your own taxes on a laptop or an iPad and have someone, you know, socially distanced who can help you if you have questions, but you have some support there to prepare it. So there's different services and there's also phone services I should mention as well, uh, depending on folks comfort level. So a variety of different options. 
The other one I would say for those of you who are uh, more comfortable um, doing taxes by yourself and want to access a free uh, site that isn't you know, involved with the free file program necessarily, myfreetaxes.com is another great resource from the United Way um, for folks, you know, if you want to be able to go in there and there is some uh, assistance that you can receive, but mostly you'd be doing it on your own and kind of using free software. So that's another great free option. And then the last option I would just mention which for the, the more brave of you or those of you who are over the income limit and looking for a free option is, you know, unlike free file, there's also free fillable forms, which can also be found on the IRS web website. It's a little confusing. But the warning is it's literally just the paper forms and electronic forms. So you have to go and do all the calculations yourself and submit it. And you can e-file uh, the federal return, in some cases, the state returns. But again, it's all on you. There's no income limit. Um, so it's pretty bare bones. And if you're looking for assistance and you meet the income qualifications, you know, uh, going to a VITA site is the best place. And like I said, you, know, you can go to the IRS website to find a VITA site or getyourrefund.org can kind of guide you through that process and offer up a lot of these different options. No, thank you, David, so much for that. Um, Rachel, I saw you nodding a few times. Um, you know, we had mentioned with the pandemic, right, um, we saw widespread job losses and a spike of people filing for unemployment. So what are ways that unemployment insurance will affect people's taxes? Um, for example, you know, do you pay taxes on it? What should people expect? So Rachel, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I just want to like really quickly revisit some more free file resources. So um, if you're in Ohio, number one, you should always be able to call 211 within Ohio. So your 211 um, will, will know sort of where local resources are. Um, we are partnering with, um, with Code for America. So if you go to getyourrefund.org, you'll be connected to a local Ohio tax preparer. Um, so that's great. But if you if your income is outside of our, our range, you can contact the AARP tax aid. At this point, they might be completely full, but they're full service um, certified um, through the same processes that VITA programs are. And they're contrary to popular belief, you do not have to be over a certain age to use AARP free tax services. So I wanted to recommend them really quickly because they're they're fantastic. Um, but in terms of unemployment, yes, that is a huge issue right now, especially with the recent legislation that was passed. So um, we know that there's been a lot of struggling, you know, a lot of suffering over the last year. Uh, and so we just want to make sure that people take advantage of all of the assistance that's out there, all of the legislation that's been uh, passed to assist them in this tough time. Um, and one of those, one of those kind of factors that will help you on your tax return if you have unemployment related income um, from last year, from 2020, is that the first $10,200 of that is actually untaxable. Um, and now this was just recently, and that's at the federal level, this was just recently sort of passed in the new legislation. And so if you already filed, you might be asking yourself, do I need to amend my tax return? The answer is no, you don't need to amend um, at least your federal return. Now states are kind of coming out with guidance on this still. So for Ohio, stay tuned. Um, there's the intention to kind of make that 10,200 also untaxable within Ohio, but the uh, legislation hasn't been finalized. The signature hasn't been um, put on the dotted line yet. So uh, we've been holding off on filing returns. We've been preparing them for the last, um, I think it's been like a week and a half, two weeks now that we've been waiting. We've been preparing, but not filing. So I would recommend that you do the same and also just kind of keep in tune with what's going on um, by following different um, public officials on social media, just doing some Googling each day, or um, if you find tax time central Ohio.org on Facebook or Twitter, um, or sorry, not .org, tax time um, of central Ohio on Twitter or Facebook, then you can kind of follow us and see, we'll definitely post if there are any changes. Um, I would also say some people aren't sure if they received unemployment income. Um, if you received money from Franklin County Job and Family Services, that is unemployment income. If you received a 1099-G, um, that could be your unemployment income or it could be fraud. So if you didn't, if you received a 1099-G in the mail, but you didn't collect unemployment, uh, you'll want to, you know, report that fraud to the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services and also 
kind of do all of the things that you would do if your identity was stolen otherwise. And if you have questions about that, um, you could probably get help from a local VITA program. No, thank you, Rachel. Um, what about people who took on gig work to replace lost income during COVID, like driving for Uber? How does that affect how their income is classified for their taxes? And Elizabeth, let's go to you. Okay, so if you had a job like an Uber driver or a Lyft or a DoorDash um, or something else where you didn't receive a W-2 or you received a 1099, you're considered to be self-employed um, because you weren't treated as an employee by the person you worked for. So you're, you're, you're considered to be self-employed and that adds some additional um, tax responsibilities. And the first one is to know when you file, you have to file something called a Schedule C, um, which is basically a self-employed sort of miniature tax return. And you can, um, you have to report your gross income and then you're allowed to take certain deductions that you wouldn't be allowed to take if you were an employee. So um, one of the real tricks here is with Uber um, and DoorDash and, and Lyft, um, it, it can be very confusing to just know how much you actually earn from them because you're gonna get several different kinds of tax forms. Um, and you want to always make sure you're looking at your final um, sort of year end statement or your monthly statements that say how much they actually paid you, how much Uber gave you to put in your bank account. And then when you go to get your returns filed, you'll have an idea of, you know, how much Uber got paid compared to how much you got paid and anything that went to Uber, you don't have to pay taxes on. You only have to pay on what you got yourself. So you would deduct that. And then the next thing to know is for those of you who haven't been fastidious about keeping your records, um, one of the things, ways you can deal with that is you're allowed to take these deductions. You're allowed to take a mileage deduction for your car. So when um, there is something called actual deductions where you would figure out how much gas you spend and maybe if you got um, a brake job or maybe if you needed new tires. Um, but one way to compensate for all that kind of receipt keeping and information is to just take a mileage deduction and you can determine how many miles you drove for that income and then take this mileage deduction. Um, so again, you need to um, file this separate return, the schedule, not a separate return, it's part of your return, the schedule C, and then you're gonna also own self, you're gonna owe self-employment income and income taxes. So you might actually find out that the taxes take a little bit bigger bite out of your, um, out of your income than if you were employed. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Next question is, knowing your income is the first step to understanding how much one will be taxed. And so, Rachel, can you walk us through how tax brackets actually work? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, and actually one that like I don't deal with on a day to day basis um, because we kind of like prepare the return in the computer and then it kind of does everything and we have to just know the policy. but. It, it is good to know, you know, how they work. Um, so basically you kind of, to determine your tax bracket, which is tax brackets are like ranges of income. And based on what range your income falls within you, um, your tax rate changes. So um, to determine your tax bracket, you basically sort of add up all of your income um, to determine your, and then you have to determine what part of that is taxable. So you reduce the overall income by deductions um, and by uh, adjustments. And then um, that will be sort of your taxable, it's called your taxable income. And then you can look at the chart like online and see where you fall. So um, they range from 10%, I'm having to look at like a chart I have to 37%. Um, and sort of people might think that, okay, if my income is, the first one for 10% is zero to about 20,000. If my income is, um, you know, in the next one, the 20,000 to 80,000, that's for married filing jointly, then, okay, I'm gonna pay that second rate, that higher rate for that second group. But in reality, you're paying 10% on the first 20,000 and then the 12% on the next amount between like the next two levels. So you're sort of paying on, on like the the margin essentially of you know of your income um it's not that important for you to know that like all the time because the software will do it for you but if you're curious it, you know you can go in and kind of figure it out on paper 
Um, another thing that people ask kind of in the same vein is whether you should um, itemize or take the standard deduction. And uh, that really depends on, you know, does your income, does your income or your, sorry, do your expenses actually exceed what that standard deduction is? So the standard deduction is sort of like, you know, a, an amount of money that you can reduce your income by, and you can either take that kind of standard one, or you can list all of your expenses and reduce your taxable income by like all of those added up expenses. So these are things that, you know, you should talk with your tax preparer about um, and do a little bit research of research on your own. Also, if you volunteer with VITA, you can learn much more. Thank you, Rachel. What is the earned income tax credit? We've heard about this a few times. Who qualifies for it? And what are the new rules for this year? David. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Yeah, the earned income tax credit yeah, is one of the most impactful tax credits out there for low and moderate income workers. You know, uh, it's a fantastic program. It's been around, or credit, it's been around since the, the 70s. And um, it's been expanded greatly over that time. Uh, but essentially, you know, it, it kind of phases in slowly and rewards folks uh, for work. And then it kind of ramps up and then slowly phases out as you get to a more moderate income level. It can be quite sizable, particularly, you know, if you're claiming dependents or children, it can get quite large. It can get up to around $6,600, uh, which, which is a massive refund. If you've ever noticed you've had a big refund in the past and you kind of fall in that, that, um, that bracket around with earned income, you probably have benefited from the earned income tax credit and not realized it. Um, and one of the one of the downsides, unfortunately, with the earned income tax credit, it's, it's incredibly complex, um, and it's led to um, a lot of issues with uh, folks who are eligible for it who don't claim it, or folks who do claim it, you know, um, and you know whether they are doing their taxes themselves or they're going to a tax preparer, it's done incorrectly, and they end up in a situation where there's uh, something called overpayments, where basically where um, basically the, the 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 credit is claimed improperly, and there needs to be a correction. So. This is another one where if you think you might be eligible for the earned income tax credit, I definitely encourage folks to go to a volunteer income tax assistance site to, to have someone, an expert, kind of guide you through that. The other thing I should plug is, you know, um, that we haven't mentioned yet, uh, again, is that VITA sites, you know, nationwide overall have the highest accuracy rates of any tax preparation firms, higher than like the commercial providers. It's, it's up in the 90s, typically. Um, so it's one of the best uh, sources you can go to to get your taxes done accurately and kind of help you navigate things like the earned income tax credit. Because like I said, it's a lot of money on the table. You know, there's like billions of dollars that are left and claimed every year. And it's estimated that about one out of every five households that's eligible doesn't claim it. Um, typically, you know, a lot of those households that don't claim it tend to be um, single workers or those who are non-custodial parents. So they get a smaller EITC. And it's usually around $500 uh, or can be as, around $500 depending on your situation. But the new tax law that you mentioned, Simon, which will go into effect for the EITC for the next tax season when we hit January um, uh, for the 2021 tax year, the 2022 calendar year, actually gives that a huge boost. It kind of almost triples it. It, it pushes it up to over $1,500. So now is, uh, is a better time than ever, obviously, not only for the earned income tax credit, for, but if you haven't claimed... Uh, one or all of the three EIPs, it's, it's, a, it's a large amount of money on the table and it really is uh, you know, in everyone's interest to claim. And then the other factor too, I think we can talk about later is the child tax credit. Uh, that was expanded as well for the next tax season, but it'll be available earlier. So it's all the more reason for folks, if you haven't filed a 2020 tax return, now is the time to do it and to take advantage of all these different pieces. And I think VITA is a, an excellent resource to make sure you're getting everything that uh, you're entitled to and you get the biggest refund possible. No, thank you so much, David, for that. I know um, we'll have some more questions kind of related to that um, later. Um, or, you know, what if someone's having trouble with the IRS? They can't get something sorted or they're getting audited. What resources can people access for problems like this? Elizabeth, I'd love to hear um, your thoughts. Okay, so the first thing I wanna tell you about if you get a letter from the IRS or the state of Ohio taxation department, um, do not ignore it. That's the worst thing that you can do. So don't ignore a letter if it comes to you. The second thing I can tell you is the IRS doesn't call you in the middle of the day and say, if you don't pay us, you're about to be arrested. Um, they 
generally will contact you by mail. They don't email you. They don't call you. The first contact is always going to be a letter. In that letter will be a phone call you can call, a phone number you can call if you have questions. Um, every letter is going to come with some kind of deadline. And generally, you should be able to read the letter and, and, and understand it. Um, and if you're in a situation where you read the letter, you understand it, and you don't know what to do, or you read the letter, you don't understand it, um, and you don't know what to do, there are, um, like VITA, there's um, these organizations called low-income taxpayer clinics that are also funded partially by the IRS, where, where they represent people who are in a, some kind of situation with the IRS that they can't resolve on their own, like an audit um, or a collection matter or something like that. And the great thing about um, those clinics is that even if they can't represent you, they will have a lot of information for you and they can give you advice about how you can help yourself. Um, and um, I'm gonna put the, uh, the, list, the list for Ohio in the chat um, when I'm done. So um, basically there is help out there. The other thing you can do if your VITA site is still open and you've been to VITA, you can go back to VITA. Um, I know a lot of times the IRS, the IRS audit cycle does not have anything to do with tax season. So you may get a letter in September or the summer where the VITA site is closed. And again, um, don't ignore it. Um, do read it, try to figure it out. If you can respond, don't send originals to the IRS ever. Um, if you respond, you should respond by mail. You can also respond by fax sometimes, and they'll give you a fax number. But just be careful to keep proof of mailing that you responded, so you certified mail, or proof that you did send in the fax. Um, and again, you will hear back from the IRS. Um, in normal times, the IRS is a very slow-moving machine. It's a very big machine, but it moves very slowly. Um, and the timetables that you think are normal are not timetables the IRS works on. So it does take them an awful long time to get back to you. Um, and if a ton of time goes by more than three or four months and you haven't heard, then you can also call your local taxpayer advocate um, and they can help you get things moving in, in the IRS system. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, that kind of goes to our last question before we um, go to audience Q&A. You know, we're talking about the IRS and the backlog of, you know, kind of the, the timetables, as you had mentioned, with the paperwork of, you know, processing stimulus checks and the pandemic, um, but also in a decade of declining funding. Are you seeing delays in tax returns? I know some folks have been in the Q&A been, you know, asking about, you know, delays in the their, their tax returns and also their, their stimulus checks. And so what, what frame, time frame should people expect? Rachel, I'd love to hear from you. That's a that's a great question. And um, others can definitely feel free to weigh in. But from what I've been, you know, reading and seeing, um, if you're electronically filing and you are um, opting into direct deposit, I think we're still seeing a one to three week wait time on those, you know, refunds being deposited. But um, when you get to filing on paper and and waiting, you know, and and asking for a paper check that's when things are taking much, much longer this year than they would normally take. So um, we're seeing if you're paper filing and requesting a check in the mail up to around two months um, waiting for those refunds. So um, I would definitely recommend electronically filing unless you absolutely have no option, um, you know, other than filing on paper um, and if you don't have a bank account, it's a good opportunity to open one. Um, I don't know if others are seeing longer waits on those um, e-file, uh, the direct deposit for e-files, but we, I haven't heard more complaints this year than I normally do. So that's a good thing. Um, but the paper files, I know they have a huge backlog of paper documents. So who knows? I mean, two months could be a low estimate. Awesome. Thank you. Did anyone else want to add to that? I think the only thing I would say too is um, for the folks who've already filed their, and this came up uh, in the past, but you know, folks who filed their 2020 tax returns, if you're claiming the recovery rebate, um, and you know, for some reason, you know, you either got one of the EIPs or you didn't get another, uh, we've heard or we've seen it anecdotally. We've kind of seen that that slows down the process as well, because I think the IRS is trying to reconcile that in the back end, and sometimes you can get stuck 
you know, if there's some type of adjustment or your, your return gets flagged, it can kind of, you know, put you in this limbo and it can, again, it could take two months. It could take longer potentially because the IRS does operate on its own time frame, And as we heard in the video, they're suffering under a lot of constraints. So things are a lot slower this year. Well, thank you. So um, we'll move um, to the uh, audience Q and A question. Uh, uh, Q and uh, I see some folks have been submitting some of their questions, which is great. And we will. Um, so if you want to ask a question, click the Q and A icon up on the screen and uh, type it, um, and we'll we'll be able to answer it. Um, so you know, one of the questions that people are having, just in general, is you know, stimulus checks. I think that there's still maybe some uh, questions about what income is it based off of, and so can we, um, what, what, um, what income, um, 2019 or 2020 are the stimulus checks based off of? So you might have to weigh in, um, others, but I believe that for the first payment, um, it was based on whatever they had as the newest information at that time. And so if you hadn't yet filed, um, yeah, you wouldn't have filed. So the first one was based on the 2019. And then the second one was, I believe, based on what you had filed most recently. So if you had already filed the 2020, then you would have gotten that, but most people hadn't. So it would have been based Sorry, maybe someone else should fill on this. I'm a little bit tongue tied on exactly the timeline. I don't know if um, anyone could explain it more clearly. Yeah, I, I think that's roughly right because it, it is very confusing because there were three rounds and you know they came at different times. The my understanding is that the first EIP, the original one from the CARES Act back um, back in 2020, that one could have been based off your 2018. Uh, uh, tax year forms as well. And then going forward, it's 2019 or 2020. Now, if you didn't file a 2020 form, like recently, like before this third round went out, they'll use your, your 2019 income to base it off of. Um, if you did file a 2020, they'll, like you, uh, Rachel, like you said, they'll use the most recent one. Uh, and to answer another question, it often comes up, you know, if your 2019 income was lower, you know, if there's a drastic difference between what they you won't have to pay it back if your 2020 um you know if it's more advantageous to use your 2019 data but you can't go back and say i want to use file your 2020 form and say i want to use my 2019 data it can get very confusing so um basically you know um you know they'll use the most recent data that they have available to get that to you and let me just also add if you didn't get the first two checks um when you file for 2020 you can tell the irs i didn't get either payment, and if you're entitled, it will be refunded to you when you file that return. Or if you got the wrong amount, um, and uh, then you can correct that. So um, like what David was saying earlier about, um, oh, it's it's like slipping my mind. Oh, right, about if you have de for delays, right? So if you put the incorrect amount, like if you don't know what you received in stimulus money in economic impact payment, and you guess and you try to estimate like what you received and you put the wrong amount on there, they're going to fix it, but they're going to take their sweet time trying to fix it. So you won't get into any kind of trouble, but it may delay your refund if you put the wrong number on there. Yeah, and the only other thing I would add that this is all this is all spot on. The only other thing I would add is it gets really confusing. People also ask about the dependents, you know, and all that and that and also uh, for families, mixed status immigration families too. there's some confusion around that there were some changes that originally were left out of the first payment, then re retroactively included if there's someone with an ITIN uh, in a household and some folks have a social security number originally they couldn't access it now you know the folks with the social security number can access it so there's some confusion there and then a lot of people were saying like 17 and older if you have kids you know for some reason they were not included in the first two rounds but the third round you know uh, kids older than 16 can be included adult dependents can be included so it's more expansive so there's there's things like that too and it's uh all the more reason again uh, I'll, I'll i'll be a broken record to go to a vita site to get <laughs> to get a volunteer who's been well trained to make sure that you're claiming all this correctly and not missing out on anything given all the confusion especially this year mm -hmm. for sure thank you yeah and that kind of adds to you know one of the the next questions of just you know what if you know um they're you know 
what if their family did change, right? With if you know they had just a kid in the last month, right? How will they benefit from the the 2021 child tax credit? I, I I'm I'm sure that um you know there's some questions about that if you know if you just had a kid versus you know you know if you qualify for the payments this year, people are um, unsure about that a little bit. Yeah, that, that's another confusing one. And it's a common scenario because life goes on and people have babies and families change. Yeah. Uh, the good news is, you know, the way that Congress wrote the third EIP is that you could, if you have a child between now and the end of the year 2021, you can still claim the most recent EIP for that child, the $1,400. So, so, or if you meet the income limits for that. So you would just have to, again, you know, like with the recovery rebate credit, you know, you would have to claim it next year on the tax form to be able to access it if it happens later in the year. I was going to add that there's been talk of a portal. Um, it's not yet. I don't know exactly when it would be released by the IRS where you can, if you've had changes in 2021, since the child tax credit actually can start being um, issued to you throughout the year um, instead of, you know, as a refund that you might, you will be able to log on to an IRS portal and make those updates. So TBD on when and how and all of that. But yes, if you don't end up getting it through that mechanism, you will be able to get it when you file, of course. Thank you. Yeah. Some yeah, of that, that money that the IRS got that they talked about in the video um, is going to actually go to help them with their, um, you know, their, their uh, infrastructure, their computer infrastructure, because obviously these are a lot of big changes for them. They can't, I, I'm, I'm no um, friend or lover of the IRS, but they really have worked really hard to make all these changes happen very quickly and try to get this money out to people very, very fast. So we're all hopeful that the portal does get up and running and, and it works. Thank you. I want to um, kind of go back into filing taxes just a little bit, you know, folks, one of the questions we got was, um, what if we didn't file last year? Um, I'd love you know, to um, any one of you to um, share what you think. But also, um, we had a question from um, folks um, watching right now. You know, what if you um, have been working in a different industry, for instance, um, and haven't filed for years, and now sh what is the, you know, should they you know, file for, tax, um, for their taxes um, for the first time? That's just in terms of like, you know, if you haven't had, you know, filed recently, like what um, should you like, or, or. I don't know who wants to take this. Um, so if you are supposed to file and you haven't filed, you should file. You should file even if you find out you're going to owe taxes and you can't afford to pay. It's always better to file that return um, because you never want the IRS to come with one of those audit letters and say, oh, you know, um, you didn't file and here's how much tax you owe. The other thing about not filing is the IRS doesn't know where you are. Maybe, maybe you've moved and they still think you live at the address where you last filed in, you don't know, 2015. And you're not even going to get that audit letter. The next thing you're going to get might be like that levy on your bank account. So it's always good to stay current with filing. If you owe taxes and you can't afford to pay, the IRS has um, mechanisms in place where they can freeze, you know, I, freeze that debt, freeze the collection on the debt, the debt's still there and the interest still grows. But if you can't afford to pay, they will put you in something called non-collectible status. Um, and, and therefore you won't have to pay. And if you can pay, even if it's a little bit, you can go on the IRS website and set up an online payment plan. Um, and sometimes it can be for a small amount every month. Sometimes they'll let you pay a small amount for a year or two. And then, you know, if things get better and you financially are in a better place, you can increase those payments. So there's a lot of options. Um, the IRS also has a 800 number to call if you owe taxes. Um, the problem is, again, that that line can get very busy. Um, and sometimes you'll be on hold for a long time. And sometimes you'll be on hold and then they'll just throw you off the line and hang up because there's no space for you. So if you do have to call the IRS, especially collection, um, and those numbers will be in the bills that you get. Um, Try to do it first thing in the morning when the lines open up. 
Yeah. And the only thing I would add too is, you know, normally if you're below a certain income, it doesn't make sense to file typically, but given everything that's happened with the EIPs, you know, and obviously, you know, if you have children dependents too, especially with this upcoming child tax credit benefit, it just makes sense to file, you know, because you may be EITC eligible too, even if you have a pretty low income and not have not have much income. And you can file for three years worth of back taxes, you know, if you go to your VITA site. So that could add up to a significant amount of money when you add it all up. So, and again, it makes sense to be in the system so you don't miss out on these letters or the payments that might be going to who knows where, depending on the last time you had an interaction with the IRS or they had a form for you. So it just makes, we're encouraging everybody to just file for 2020 for sure to make sure that they're not missing out on any of these benefits. I always also tell people to file to protect against identity theft. Just one more thing, because if your return gets rejected, you know that someone used your social security number. You can you can file a zero return also, um, even if you don't have income. And again, like this these this new child tax credit that's you know going to be beginning, I believe, David, it's July, right, of twenty twenty one. Um, you really want to get a return filed. And someone noted that the portal won't be ready until July in the chat. And I just want to say like. The IRS has got to get tax season over. Um, and I think that while they're probably thinking realistically, we need tax season to be over before we can focus on um, getting these monthly payments out to families. We have a few more minutes left, thank you. Um, uh, one of the questions that we um, got was, you know, if you do not have a business, what items are still deductible? So home, business, medical, et cetera. And you know, for folks who are you know freelancers, what um, on the opposite side, what are kind of the things that are deductible? Um, you want to go ahead, Rachel? Are you ready? I I'm not right. ready, mentally uh, ready for this. So, okay, you so <laughs> first of all, when you're employed and you're an employee, there's a lot, very few deductions you can take. The main deductions that you can take are your home mortgage interest and um, property taxes or, or state income taxes. Um, you're also allowed to deduct medical expenses, but only when you have a lot of medical expenses, like they exceed 10% of your income. And those are all the itemized deductions, Rachel, we're talking about. So if those don't add up to more than your standard deduction, it doesn't even matter because you're not gonna bother taking a lower deduction than the standard deduction. Um, there used to be these other itemized deductions you're allowed to take, um, and they've all basically been disallowed um, under the new tax law that was passed in 2017. Um, there are small things you can take. Everyone can take up to $300 of a charitable deduction. Um, if you're a teacher, um, you're allowed to take a small amount uh, that you spend um, for your classroom items. Um, if you're self-employed, the game sort of changes and there's all this stuff that you're allowed to take. And um, basically, if you're self-employed and you're filing that Schedule C, you're allowed to deduct any amount of money that you spend to create the income. So that mileage that you're driving your car, um, maybe you had to take a license. Um, maybe you got your commercial driver's license this year and you had to take a test um, or you had to take a class that would be deductible. So anything that helps you generate the income is deductible if you're self-employed. Um, and honestly, I know we talked about good resources for filing taxes. Um, and you know, if you're not eligible for VITA, I do think those commercial softwares, if you just go out and buy them sort of off the shelf, like at Target or um, you know Walmart, um, they're relatively inexpensive and they take you through a series of questions. And those questions will help get to, if you answer them correctly, you should be able to get to the right place um, for filing if you're self-employed, because it's a little bit harder. And I think VITA has some restrictions also when you're self-employed. I was going to add in Ohio, um, if your medical expenses are seven, more than seven and a half percent of your income, um, you can actually deduct those on your state return. Um, going back to unemployment, um, what if, uh, what happens if someone gets unemployment from a state that they don't currently live in? Um, so if you earn income in any state, you have to file a state tax return generally in that state. Um, and sometimes you'll be due a refund. So um, if I live in, I live in New York, but if I worked in New Jersey, I would have to file a New York retur state return because that's where I live and a New Jersey return because that's where I worked. Um, 
unemployment often comes without taxes being deducted. Um, so you may owe taxes, especially if it's over that um, threshold of the 10,000, I think it's $10,200 um, that's exempt. And it might not be exempt in the state at all. So um, Rachel explained at the beginning that maybe the unemployment right now, it's not exempt in Ohio and they may change the law. So um, I don't know if anyone wants to add to that. Awesome. Well, um, I think that I'm just going through the questions. It seems like we were able to, you know, cover, um, you know, the questions that people were able to ask. Um, but I just wanted to thank everyone again, our panelists. So David, Rachel, and Elizabeth, who um, gave their time to, you know, you know, provide such an informative discussion and for our audience, for um, your terrific questions. And again, you'll receive an email uh, tomorrow with some resources that we talked about, as well as the full video of tonight's session, just so folks can, you know, look back on different um, resources and different um, things that we talked about. And um, so from all of us um, at ProPublica uh, and Co for America, thank you for joining us and have a great night and we'll see you next time.